So talking about AI uh, is not easy because it's brought up almost every day in almost every publication. And the debate that we are facing, it seems, is simple, right? Is it evil, like really evil, as Elon Musk is saying? Or is it a panacea? I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, but we have to be making our decisions based on the evidence. So my purpose here today is to provide you with some evidence that will help you to make a decision about this. In particular, I care about how AI is already changing healthcare. This is Mako, it's a robot that was used to replace the hip of um, a first responder to 9-11. And this uh, hip replacement happened perfectly. Since then, this was uh, several years ago, over 100 surgeries have happened, and they're currently considering of using Mako to actually use it in other contexts and other bone structures. This is even closer to home. This is Ludwig that was developed by my colleague at Vector, Dr. Frank Rudzic. And Ludwig um, doesn't only provide kind of a, a companion to elderly, it tracks whether there is a pattern in speech deterioration to see if a nurse needs to be called um, to, to the individual so to prevent a potentially critical event. In my case, uh, we develop a lot of tools for a lot of different diseases, but I want to talk about one in particular and what does it mean. It was motivated by a story. A 12-year-old boy, healthy, was uh, going skiing, doing very well. As you can see, I think he's doing pretty well. Unfortunately, um, he fell and uh, fractured his femur. So he was actually airlifted to sick kids, to critical care where a surgery was performed. The surgery was successful, except they didn't know that a clot was formed uh, during the surgery. During the next 24 hours, this clot traveled to his heart and called, caused uh, cardiac arrest. Fortunately, the boy survived cardiac arrest, but caused, uh, the, the arrest caused a severe brain damage. I don't know if you know, but cardiac arrest is a pretty severe condition, a pretty severe uh, event. Um, in, um, what, if it happens at home, there's only a 14% uh, survival rate. If it happens at the hospital, the survival rate is almost twice that much, but it's still only 36%. And you can see, even if patients survive, it um, results very often in this uh, uh, terrible uh, outcomes such as brain damage. So the only way, the only way to really make a difference here is through prevention. Let us not have this cardiac arrest. Let, let that boy um, not get there. And the clinicians are trying to make this prevention happen. More and more hospitals have a lot of this different uh, data collection efforts, and they're collecting a lot of different kinds of data for every patient. So for example, here you have the heart rate, the pulse, the oxygen, the uh, blood pressure. There's a lot of information. Some of it is streaming, so it's, it's constantly going. Some of it is more static. But all of this information is available for one patient. Now, at critical care at SickKids, we have 42 beds. This image is of the uh, critical care unit at SickKids that was kindly provided to me by my close collaborator, the head of critical care, Dr. Peter Lawson. So every one of these patients is in critical condition. Every one of them has these and potentially other monitors for other things that they're connected to that are giving them uh, data. And in fact, the amount of data is so big that Peter very often compares it to Niagara Falls. So, Niagara Falls throughput of water per second is 200,000 uh, uh, cubic feet. At the hospital, in critical care, at SickKids, they see 200,000 bytes of data per second. So this is a lot of data. It's a lot of data to process. It is not humanly possible to keep track of everything at all times, even though there is a lot of stuff on hand, of course. So something can be missed. And this is... I think where AI has a real opportunity to shine. 
we take information of the patient and together with Peter and his team, we have developed a tool, a deep learning uh, approach that takes the streaming data and estimates the risk of patient having a cardiac arrest in the next five to 15 minutes. So what this allows uh, the clinician is to focus on a single uh, kind of output of, um, of a model, right? So this is very nice. It's much easier to keep track of. So this is great. We have the team. That's a wonderful team, really. Uh, we have a model. Are we ready for deployment? And I think this is what, as machine learners, we don't often think about when we are developing algorithms. We think about the data that's going in. We think about the model itself. We think about what we are modeling, what we will report, what uh, the outcome is. But we don't really think about this practical deployment situations and scenarios. So here, fortunately, the number of cardiac arrests at SeaKids is uh, pretty small. So it's 100 cardiac arrests per year uh, for those 42 beds. So if you assume that um, there are this few events, the system still has to make a decision for every patient all the time. So if every five minutes we check the system and ask it to evaluate a given patient, and we do it for, say, on average 30 beds, 365 days a year. It means the system has to make 3 million decisions per year whether the, a given patient is going to have a cardiac arrest in the next 5 to 15 minutes. So even if the system were really good and only had a 1% error rate, this would result in 30,000 false positive alarms. And this is this is something that uh, machine learners don't necessarily think, the deployment scenario, how rare some of these events that we are trying to uh, predict are. And it, it is incredibly important. So what happens is, you might say, false positives are really not as important. What we care about is false negatives. Did we, let's not miss patients. Maybe false positives are okay, right? We go, we check on the patient, patient is okay, no problem. But the reality is that since this is a critical unit, critical care unit, they get a lot of alarms, and there is an alarm fatigue. And even if the system is performing pretty well on um, kind of the false negative front, because there are so many false positives, they stop paying as much attention to the system, creating more false negatives than the system would necessarily predict. So the deployment and this kind of questions really need to be thought about when uh, deploying AI in practice. Another very important issue is we have a risk, right? The risk is not something your doctor is intimately familiar with. They didn't necessarily learn what, how to interpret this risk in their practice. So when they see, and they know that the system is imperfect, right? The system um, is most likely never going to be perfect because the data isn't perfect that we are feeding in. It's often missing, there's noise. So what clinician needs to know is why the system has made this decision to cause an alarm. In this particular case, we developed another solution that goes back to the original data, the signal that the clinician really understands and highlights very quickly why the system has made this alarm sound. And this data, the clinicians are very familiar with, so just tracking what was important and why the alarm went off might help them to make the decision of whether to call the team and prepare for the cardiac arrest prevention rather than just ignore this alarm. I want to say something that is not often talked about, uh, but we are facing as we want to deploy this. We want the patients to benefit from these tools is the integration with a hospital IT system. It might seem boring to you, but this is incredibly important because the hospitals actually have a lot of, uh, are supporting a lot of um, decisions and they're supporting uh, the data that is uh, being collected all the time. They have to make sure that there's, it is secure and safe and private. And if we are asking it to deploy a method, a high uh, capacity system that is um, running real-time, all the time, 
we have to really make sure that they are ready to deploy it right next to all these other tasks and decisions that the system has to make. And this is incredibly important for us to work closely with IT specialists at the hospital if we want anything to be deployed at all. So it has to be thought of upfront and these connections and decisions have to be made. And finally, but not the least at all, I want to talk about data. So one might say, okay, this is great. AI systems, critical ill patients, what, what does it matter to me? But the reality is that the, one of the biggest reasons why, um, for example, AI, there are no, not more AI models that are happening in uh, healthcare that are not leading to prevention is because of access to data. It is very, very difficult to access patient data. A lot of people are citing privacy uh, concerns, et cetera. But the reality is that without this data, there will be no AI. AI is like, is, it's like blood for humans, data is for AI. And that cannot be overlooked. And that actually is an opportunity for people to contribute. So you can, as a patient, if you are a patient, to uh, tell your provider and talk to the policymakers to say, I want my data to contribute so that the better tools are built so that my care is improved. This makes a very big difference to uh, enabling this, uh, this revolution. So what do I think about how AI is cha changing uh, healthcare? Well, I think it's a small thing that will make a big difference in a space of prevention. And this has happened before. Here, a little bit of fluoride was added to water, which has actually absolutely changed the dental health of the world. Vaccines are co constantly being used uh, to avert real disasters, epidemics. This, this has made a real difference. And to me, AI is really going to change healthcare in the space of prevention. We can take the data that exists and we can forecast a lot of the critical events that can happen and prevent them. Make a prediction and com to contribute to the uh, medical knowledge and make that happen. So I really hope that with this example, uh, I gave you some evidence towards thinking that it is closer to panacea than evil. There is a lot of good that AI can do in a healthcare space. Thank you. <laughs>